gardening all the time uh, and they're gardening more and more since the pandemic started. We're seeing you know, seeds selling out in some places, especially if you're ordering from specialty catalogs. Uh, we had that happen uh, in the gardening season last year as well. So if you're looking to start seeds, it would be a good job, good idea to, to if you haven't already shopped, to do your shopping uh, for seeds uh, early to get them before they sell out. I know I was uh, at a local box store uh, the other day and they still had a good selection on the seed rack uh, so there are seeds available locally, but I know some catalogs like Johnny's Seeds, which, you know, their main, their main customers are farmers, but they do sell to homeowners. They stop taking orders from homeowners and only are selling to farmers. And so you want to, to be on the lookout uh, to be able to get uh, the seeds that you're looking for. So you're not like me last year and end up with white beets instead of red beets. They just don't look the same when they're canned. They look a little weird as a pickled beet. But uh, go ahead and, and look for those seeds and you can find the seed starting supplies that you'll need at the same time. And we'll talk about that. So seed starting is one of those things that's mostly science, but there's a little bit of art to it. Well, you have to sort of have the knack for it, the patience uh, and a little bit of equipment and knowledge. So we're gonna talk about what you need to do to be successful at starting seeds. First, I wanna talk about the types of plants that you might encounter at the seed rack. And we get this question a lot, like what, what, do, what do the words on the seed rack actually mean? And the, the word that we hear the most is heirloom uh, versus hybrid, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but I'm gonna start with one other, and it's called open pollinated. And it means it's a non-hybrid variety, meaning if you save the seeds from it, it will be similar to the parent. It's called breeding true. So if you have an open pollinated variety of tomato, let's say, uh, you grow that tomato and you save the seeds from that tomato, it's going to be very similar to the seeds that you planted to the, the tomato that you grew. And so that's the, the scientific term for it. Now, if that open pollinated variety or cultivar has uh, a history, if it's been around for 50 or more years or if it's been passed down through a family or if it has like a regional, um, a regional story to it, then it's an heirloom. Uh, that just basically means like it came from a certain area, it came from a certain family or it's been around a long time. So some examples like in Nebraska, an heirloom tomato is the Nebraska wedding tomato um, that's been around for a long time. It's open pollinated. If you save the seeds, you'll get Nebraska wedding tomatoes. Uh, I'm originally from West Virginia. The big um, tomato heirloom from West Virginia is the mortgage lifter. A lot of people grow those. Um, and that's a, an heirloom uh, that some guy actually developed in his garden and sold them. The story was that he convinced all of his neighbors that they were great tomato plants and that they should buy them. And he raised enough money to pay off the mortgage on the farm. So that's why it's called the mortgage lifter. We're going to then talk about different types of plants. So we have a hybrid. And a hybrid is basically one where uh, the genetics of an art stable enough for you to save the seeds from it. So if you save the seeds from a, uh, a hybrid tomato or a hybrid plant, you're going to get a mix of different traits from the, the parents that were used to create that. There's typically a mother and a father plant that are used to create those every time that the seeds are harvested. Uh, and if you save the seeds from those, you can save the seeds from them usually. Uh, there's nothing that, that keeps them from germinating or growing, but you're going to end up with plants that have some traits of the mother, some that have the traits of the father, and then as I say, some that have traits of the milkman. Like you don't know where those traits came from. So it's just a mix. So uh, you can definitely save them. They're just not going to be, uh, be able to, to, to have the traits exactly as you had them in the plant that you bought. And then we get a lot of confusion from people uh, at the seed rack or buying uh, plants online like, oh, I don't wanna buy GMO seeds. I don't wanna buy genetically engineered seeds. Uh, and for, for the most part, and, and at least currently, nothing that you buy at the store, nothing you can go to the seed rack and buy, nothing you can buy from a garden catalog is genetically engineered or GMO. Uh, it's just not the way the the economies of this work. They wanna sell large quantities to farmers for 
for these genetically engineered seeds. And so nothing that you can buy as a home gardener uh, is genetically engineered or GMO. You actually have to sign a legally binding agreement in order to purchase them. And I don't see them doing that at, you know, like Walmart or Lowe's or Home Depot whenever you go to the seed rack uh, to buy these. So that's one thing you don't have to worry about. It's just a technique that's used for them to introduce traits easier uh, to plants rather than doing the breeding. But it's something that you don't really have to worry about. And unfortunately, a lot of garden catalogs have used it as a marketing ploy and created a lot of fear around that. So you'll see garden catalogs that say, you know, absolutely no GMO or non-GMO. And it's actually basically, it's not false advertising, but it's not really true advertising because no garden catalog sells uh, genetically engineered seeds. There are no GMOs available in any garden catalog. So it's sort of just like a, a marketing gimmick or even sometimes some catalogs or companies take it to almost like the scam level. Like you have to buy our seeds because they're non-GMO uh, when all the other seeds are also non-GMO as well. So you just got to watch out for that marketing. So what do seeds need in order to germinate. So we're gonna talk about the needs uh, first and then how we're gonna to get them. So we need water. Uh, germination begins with imbibition. So if you've ever heard of someone imbibing, it means that they drink. So I'm imbibing, I'm drinking something. Uh, it's the same with seeds. So that begins the process of germination. Um, whenever they take up the water, it starts a chain of hormone and uh, uh, chemical reactions in the seed that lets them start growing. Once they become wet, you should not let seeds dry out. The seeds will, you know, that will kill the seeds because we've already started that process. So you don't want them to dry out after you've started the process. And that's one of the hardest things to do whenever we're starting seeds because if we forget to water them for a few days, they might dry out and we've lost our seeds or our seedlings. And then oxygen is the other big thing. So even in storage, seeds require oxygen. They're living, they're breathing, they're respirating, and they're burning energy. Uh, so respiration increases during the germination process. So whenever the seeds get wet and germination initiates, it's a really fast uptake of oxygen that gets them started. And so because of that, our seed starting media has to be special because we have to have enough room for it to be wet but we also have to have it light and fluffy in order for it to have enough air to have oxygen in it. Because if we use a really heavy potting soil or soil or something to start our seeds, that really reduces the amount of oxygen that's available whenever we introduce water into the situation. So that's why we'll talk about seed starting mixes in a bit, but they have to be very light and fluffy in order to accommodate that. We also have to have the right temperature for seeds. And each seed is a little bit different in its temperature requirement. Now, what we're talking about mostly today are like the fruits and the vegetables and the flowers that we wanna start. And they're all about the same uh, in their temperature requirement. This temperature is for the growing media, not for the air. That's the one thing to keep in, in mind. Because um, for, for most things that we're going to grow, the ideal temperature for germination is around 75 degrees. There are a few things that like it a little bit warmer. There are a few things that like it a bit cooler, but for home, for anything that you're going to grow, you would want to aim for about 75 degrees in temperature. And that is the soil because who keeps their house thermostat at 75 or 80 degrees? And even if you do that, how warm does your house really stay? So that's why you'll see uh, in garden centers or in garden catalogs, you'll get a, like a seed heating mat that you will see. So I have one, I brought one from the office uh, and don't mind it, it's well used, it's dirty. Uh, and it's also fairly large, but it's this big plastic mat that we lay out on the table and we lay our, we put our seeds on there, it plugs in and it warms up the whole surface to about 75 degrees. And then hopefully that warms the soil up to about 75 degrees. Uh, and that's the temperature where we want our seedlings uh, so that we can get them a good start. Uh, so we use those growing mats. Um, I've been in situations in greenhouses where they use different, different setups. They have like a, a germination area 
where they use like heating coils or cables. Uh, you could use something like DIY, like I've seen people using heat pads, um, but you wanna be careful because those things aren't necessarily rated to get wet. And so you wanna to watch out, but you can buy those. You can get them between 20 and 30 bucks now and they'll last for many, many years. The trick with seedlings though is, and I, we had this question come in via email, was how do I keep my seeds from getting leggy? And that is in one of the things in the heat. We think that the seedlings need to stay at 75 degrees, but really they just need to be at 75 degrees for the first few weeks as they're getting started. After they've actually germinated and they've come up, you want to move them to a cooler place between 55 and 60 degrees so that then um, the plants are growing slower but stronger. If you keep it too warm and not have enough light, that's the other factor that affects it, then you can actually get this really uh, leggy sort of weak growth. And so after you get them germinated, you want to move them somewhere cooler. Now, if you don't have a heating mat and you don't want to buy one, there are a few tricks that you can do. And I know it sounds weird, but we know that heat travels upward in the house. So it is warmer, closer to the ceiling than it is on the floor. Uh, and there's also an appliance in our house that creates a lot of heat. So if you're able to, if you don't, if you need a place to start your seeds, what you do is you get, your, get yourself a step ladder or a step stool and you clean off the top of your refrigerator and you can stick your seeds on top of the refrigerator to get them started. You won't need, we'll talk about lights in a second, but you won't need lights in order to sit, start most seeds. But you can put them on top of the refrigerator to, to give them a warm place, or you can get a seed starting mat. Some people will put them near like a heat vent, and that presents a problem because that's going to dry it out very quickly. So I would recommend a mat or to put them on top of the refrigerator, which sounds weird, but it works. So let's talk about that optimum temperature. Like I said, it's gonna be different for each plant. For most of the home garden things we grow, it's around 75 degrees. And here's why it's important. So if we look at this chart, we see that in the middle of this chart, we have the optimum temperature. So let's say that's 75 degrees for our tomatoes that we're growing. So the green dots represent the percent of germination. So we see that at that optimum temperature, we get close to 100% germination. And as we go on either direction of that optimum temperature, the germination rate goes down. And that's because um, of what happens with the red bar. And that's the, the days to emergence, how long it takes to germinate. So the farther we get away from that optimum temperature, the longer it takes to germinate. So we can go from like one or two days to germinate to a week or more to germinate. And the longer it takes to germinate, the more likely we are to uh, use all of the energy that's stored in the seeds, the more likely we are to have a fungus attack it, uh, to have a disease or, or something happen. And so we want to germinate faster so that we can increase that germination rate. So this is really important um, indoors whenever we're starting seeds, but also if you're direct sowing seeds into the garden, you'll want to look and see what is the germination temperature of uh, this certain seed, like Elizabeth is planting her peas. So peas germinate at a lower temperature than 75 degrees. It can be around 45 or 50 degrees, but she might want to look at like a, a weather station to see what the soil temperature is before she plants her peas. And you can do that. There are weather stations all around the state that you can look up and find soil temperatures for if you're planting outside. So the next thing is light. Uh, and for most things, uh, most seeds re require some sort of light after they've germinated. But some, a lot of the seeds that we plant, they don't need light to germinate, they actually need dark. And the way you can tell this is by looking at the seed packet or looking up the information and it'll say, you know, bury the seed X number of inches deep. That means that it doesn't need light to germinate. If the seed packet says sprinkle on top of the soil, it needs light to germinate. And so that's the way you can tell whether or not you're going to have to, pro to provide supplemental light from the beginning versus after the, it gets started. Uh, because you don't necessarily need light right when it's starting 
if it doesn't require light. So um, one example, a lot of the lettuces require light, so you'll sprinkle them on top of the soil versus a tomato or a pepper need to be buried. And so that's one way you can tell. So you couldn't really start your lettuce maybe on top of the fridge if it's dark, but your tomatoes or peppers, since they don't need that light in the beginning, you could start them in a dark place and move them to somewhere where there's light after they're germinated. Uh, you should have a seed packet that tells you how deep to plant them. Uh, if not, it's usually about twice the width of the seed. We can talk about that in a bit. And so in most cases, you're going to want to use supplemental light in order to grow your seedlings after you get them germinated. But you're going to be growing them indoors for a few weeks, usually between six to eight weeks before you plant them outside. And a sunny window might work, but you're going to have a lot better results if you use some sort of supplemental light. I'll briefly touch on the options uh, in the next slide. And then if you stick around until 11 o'clock, Scott will talk about uh, the options more in depth. Um, if we think about um, the, the different sources of light, probably the one that you are most familiar with is the fluorescent. Those are the easiest and the cheapest. You can go to most hardware stores, big box stores, and you get the fluorescent tubes. You can get the plant, right, plant lights. Um, you can find like full spectrum white plant lights. You can mix it and get like, if you can't find a, a pure white plant light, you can get like a warm fluorescent and a cool fluorescent to make sure you have all the spectrum colors. Uh, we're seeing a lot more LEDs these days. I have LED plant lights at home because they're more energy efficient. Uh, and if you're growing stuff for a short period of time, like for our seedlings or I grow microgreens sometimes, a lot of people are using the red and blue lights only because they can concentrate the light. And that's the light that the plants use the most is red and blue. And so they're using those to concentrate that light for short periods of time. But then there's also metal halides and incandescents. And really it's finding one that works best for you. Uh, LEDs usually are more expensive in the beginning, but they use a lot less energy and they create a lot less heat. Uh, and so uh, if you're having like lots of them, they can create heat issues, especially in small rooms. Uh, so you wanna think about those things. Uh, and I'm sure Scott will talk about those more in depth. So when we're, planting our plants, we have to use a medium, uh, some sort of media to, to put the seeds in. Uh, and it needs to be fine and uniform and well aerated or loose. And we talked about the reason we need a lot of oxygen in around that, that new plant. So we don't want anything too heavy. It also should be free of diseases and weed seeds. Um, so you don't want to use anything that has any bacteria or fungus in it. And so um, whenever we're purchasing things, we want to look for that. And I'll show you, I have a bag of seed starting mix here. Uh, we also want it low in fertility. Um, the thing about it is that seeds actually have enough food, enough nutrients in them to get the plant up to the set, first set of true leaves. And I'll explain what that is later. But you don't need to have for a lot of fertilizer in the beginning. Um, Number one, the plant doesn't need it. And number two, that fertility feeds those fat, uh, the, the bacteria and the fungus that can attack the plant. So you want it relatively sterile in terms of what nutrients are in it. You also want it sterile in terms of um, bacteria and fungi. So you don't wanna use, like if you're, we'll talk about a, a homemade mix, but some people I know put compost in their seed starting mix, which I think is a no-no. It's not a best practice because that's introducing bacteria and fungi that could attack your plants. Uh, most commercial mixes will not have compost in them. They'll be inert, uh, soilless ingredients. Uh, and so you can do a commercially pre prepared or a DIY. So you're going to ignore the brand name here, right? Don't, don't look there. Um, but this is a seed starting mix. Uh, and I'll, I'll do a, a short demonstration briefly so you can see the seed mix. But unfortunately, most of the, the companies that do seed starting mixes are fertilizer companies, so they add fertilizer. It's not really needed. Um, but you can look in here and the ingredients are um, like peat moss and vermiculite and perlite. There's no soil, there's no compost. That's what you wanna look for. 
because it needs to be relatively sterile uh, in what you're offering. Now, if you wanted to do a DIY, uh, you can mix up some, some ingredients. So you can use peat moss or coconut core, which is becoming more popular um, because it is more sustainable. It's not, you know, peat is harvested from peat bogs in Canada and it's a non-renewable resource. Core is actually leftover fibers from coconut processing. You can actually get it in bricks, like compressed bricks that then you add water to and um, sort of fluff it up. Uh, and then you can do vermiculite and perlite. You can mix equal parts or you can do more peat moss or, and core and a little bit less vermiculite and perlite. This gives you a nice light fluffy mix. If you're using peat moss, you'll want to add a little bit of like agricultural lime because it can be a little bit acidic. So you need to buffer that pH uh, a little bit. So when do you start your seeds? That's a good question. So you want to choose a transplant date based on the frost date. So I'll have on the next screen, I'll have a map of Nebraska with some, some basic dates. If you're elsewhere, you'll have to look up your frost map or frost data on online. Uh, but you want to look at the date that you want to plant it out in the garden. So if I'm starting tomatoes, I can say in Nebraska, usually I can plant them outside like the first week of May. So then I see on the packet of tomato seeds that it says start six to eight weeks before planting outdoors or before last frost. And you'll want to see what it says. Uh, and then you'll count backwards that on the calendar. So if we count backwards, let's say I'm planting um, just to make it make it easy. I'm going to plant my tomatoes outside May 1st. And I'm going to hope that it doesn't frost or freeze because there's still a little bit of a chance. So then I'm gonna back up six weeks or eight weeks from there. So if I'm doing May 1st, I need to back up to March 15th for the middle of, for, for six weeks or the beginning of March, end of February for eight weeks. And so you can sort of calculate out when you need to start stuff. And it'll say on, on, the, on the seed packet, how many weeks before last frost or before planting to start stuff. Now, the other thing is that you can do this for fall crops too. And in Nebraska, we can grow a lot of stuff like um, leafy greens, bro uh, the, the coal crops like broccoli, Brussels sprouts. They actually do better in the fall. And so you can actually count backwards and plant them. And you would start those like July, August for fall planting. And so you can, you can look at those things too. So it's not just for spring planting that we're looking at that. So for Nebraska, here's a basic map. Eastern Nebraska, usually it's the, the very end of April to mid-May when our last freeze or, or frost is. As you go west, it's a little bit later. All the way up in that uh, top uh, corner of Nebraska, the panhandle, when it could be June before we see the last, the last frost. Now, there are not a lot of people that live up in that corner, so it affects fewer people. Uh, but we definitely can have late frosts, especially out in Western Nebraska. So what do we use for a container? So we can use flats or trays. Uh, we buy those at the, the garden center. You can order them from catalogs. You can recycle them. Um, and we'll talk about recycling containers. You can do recycled items like container, you know, yogurt containers, cottage cheese containers, butter containers. Uh, I use, sometimes I'll use um, like takeout containers. If we order like Chinese, you'll get those nice pl black plastic containers. Uh, you can use those things. Um, typically what we tell people to do is to start in a bulk container where you're planting everything together and then move to individual containers. So for example, so here's my black plastic tray, you know, that I want to start everything in. Um, Sometimes if you look at it in a catalog, it's referred to as a 1040 tray. So if you're looking for them and you can't find it, 1040. So I might want to put my individual plants in these little cell packs like this. This is sometimes you buy them and they're like this. But I'm not guaranteed that if I, if I plant individual seeds in here, that they're going to grow. Plus, at some point, I need to move my plants from a seed starting mix, which doesn't have fertil fertilizer, to a potting soil, which does. And so that's one of the things that a lot of people mess up. So I want to use my seed starting mix 
in a bigger container where I just throw all my seeds in there. And then after they germinate, I'm going to pull them out of this bulk container and plant them individually in my cell pack or in my four inch pot or whatever pot that I'm doing. And we want to do that uh, before they get too big. Because if we, if we forget to do that, we'll also stunt their growth unless we're like providing them a lot of fertilizer. Uh, and so we'll talk about that uh, as well. So when we water, we want to use a fine mist sprayer if we're top watering or what we want to water from the bottom. So that's the nice thing about, you know, you can get the black plastic trays uh, that don't have holes in them so that you can set these containers that do have holes in them in there and you add a little bit of water. You don't want them to set in water. If you set in water too long, that's going to, to displace all the oxygen in the, the mix and you don't want to do that. So um, you'll, you can see here that in my black plastic tray that it's been used before. And what we want to do is if we're using a recycled container, we want to make sure it's clean and sterilized because we don't want, if there was any bacteria or fungus on this tray, we don't want that to transfer over into our new seedlings. So we want to wash this. So there's a little bit of soil left in the bottom of this. I would wash this with like soapy water dish soap with maybe a scrub brush, clean all of that off. And then what I would want to do is to sterilize it somehow. And the easiest way to do that would be to get you a, a larger container, like a, one of those big Rubbermaid tubs, or you could do it in the bathtub, but mix up um, a solution of like 10% bleach. So just household bleach, mix it up like one, you know, one cup of bleach to 10 cups of water, and you dip it in, you let it set for a few seconds, you pull it out and you let it air dry. And that can help you reduce the pathogens that might be on there. And you wanna do that for any of the containers that you're reusing uh, because you wanna make sure that they're clean and sterile. So another trick is to keep the humidity high. You know, that will keep the plants from losing a lot of water. It'll also keep the soil from drying out too quickly. Uh, and so uh, if you have a way to increase the humidity, you won't have to water as often. So sometimes you can buy those black plastic trays that have a humidity dome on top. Usually the ones that you buy uh, like at a box store, if you go to Lowe's or Walmart or Home Depot, uh, you can um, get ones that have a short dome. You can use that for uh, like when, they, when the seedlings are very small. If you want to have a humidity dome on them for much longer, from garden catalogs, you can order uh, the humidity domes that are very tall. You can also do some tricks like um, using some, some loose plastic and like uh, I've seen people do like uh, chopsticks and then you put like saran wrap or plastic on it. Uh, you can get a little mini greenhouse, but you want to have some way to increase the humidity. And we want to keep those um, humidity levels um, and water levels uh, sort of even. Uh, so alternatives to bleach, so there are some things that you can buy, like Scott said in the chat, Fisan 20 or Consan 20. You know, we use those a lot in commercial production. Um, you know, bleach, you know, is one of those, like, it's the best thing, and a lot of people are scared of bleach, but it's been used for centuries. Um, but if you're not wanting to use bleach, you can get, it's not as good as bleach, but you can use, like, just straight household vinegar. Uh, as uh, a, a, a disinfectant. Um, it is not as effective, but it will give you some protection. Uh, so just, you know, go buy white vinegar from the grocery store. It's not as good, but we, we do tell people, even in like farming that do, that are doing like food safety protocols, you can use vinegar a little bit uh, as uh, something, as an alternative. So this is not, if you buy seeds from the, the seed rack or from a seed company, if this needs to be done, they've already done it. But we had people asking, well, what if I collect seeds from natives in Nebraska or you know, from this tree or shrub that I wanna try to grow? First, you want to do some research. So I know I have someone that asked me, I want to start seeds from this shrub in my yard. Well, you actually want to, to look that up uh, you can look that up online. Usually there's usually a protocol for doing that. Used to, we had these things called books that you would look this up, stuff up. 
you know, people, you know, you can, you can still find these old horticulture books, you know, like plant, plant propagation books that tell you how to start this seed and that seed. But there might be two different processes that you would have to do. Like, I know uh, some people that were interested in growing ginseng as a medicinal herb and to sell. Um, and uh, it's actually a stratification process where you have to cold treat it. And it's actually like two years, like you put it in soil or in a medium and you put it in the refrigerator and you keep it in there for months and then you plant it out and it still takes like almost a year for the thing to germinate. Um, there's scarification, which means basically breaking the seed coat somehow. So all seeds have a protective covering on it. So you wanna, some, some of them, like if you buy them commercially, companies will have soaked it in an acid solution to dissolve some of the seed coat. Or you might be able to break or crack or file or sandpaper some of the seed coats. I know like there's the classic example, there's a pine tree that grows in the Western US that only germinates after a fire. It's because the fire cracks the seed coat. Uh, it, it sort of burns off the seed coat. And then there could be a cold treatment. So you actually put it in like sand or moss or something loose and slightly damp. And you have to put it in a refrigerator or plant it and put it outside. You know, so it, it is sort of um, recreating what nature would do if you planted it outside and it had winter. And so you have to give it that cold treatment in order to grow. So once we get our seedlings started, we're going to grow them up to at least our first true seed leaf, or our first true leaf. Uh, and yes, I see a question. For store and catalog, you don't need to soak the seeds. That's correct. You don't need to do any of that. That's for, you know, we get those questions like, how do I start this thing that I picked up out of my garden or, you know, that I found on a nature walk? Well, research what it is and figure out what the process is. Um, most things that we grow in from like the vegetable garden, you don't have to do this. The one exception is tomatoes. Tomatoes have a protective coat on them. And so in order to save tomato seeds, you want to ferment it. So I mix mine with water and let them set a few days. And that takes that seed coat off of it. Uh, but otherwise, most stuff that you'll buy at the, the, the store, if it needed to have that process done, the company's already done it for you. And it's very rare that most stuff that we grow in home gardens requires a process like that. So once we get our seedlings up to a good size, uh, we don't want to leave them in the germination mix too long because there's not a lot of fertility in there and they need food, they need nutrients. So we want to, to transplant when, we when we're at the at least the first set of true leaves, maybe the second set, but plants, the seeds have enough energy and food stores to get them to that first set of true leaves. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide. So this seedling mix should be more fertile. So it could be a potting mix. I even saw at the grocery at the store yesterday and I bought one and I forgot to bring it with me. Um, but there is actually now a, a company making a mix for young plants. So it's like more fertility than a seed starting mix, but less than a potting soil and it's looser than a potting soil. And so you can find stuff like that. If you do use potting soil, you want a good quality one that's mostly peat moss and vermiculite. I've seen some potting, cheap potting soils that are very heavy and very dense, and you don't want that. You still want something light and fluffy, but you need some fertility in there. So you're gonna carefully dig up the seedling and move it in, into its new container with the potting soil, with the fertility. You wanna plant it the same depth as what it was. So the seed will show you, like you'll see the roots, you'll see the little stem. You wanna plant it at the right depth. You wanna, don't wanna bury it too deep. And you want to keep them away from bright sun, direct light, and heat for a few days because you've basically uh, created a lot, of a lot of shock. You've ripped their roots out of the soil and they need to reestablish their little roots, their little root hairs, before you really put them in the sun, before you give them a lot of bright light. And so it'll take a minute to do that. So here we have a seedling. This is a tomato seedling. You see these big, long, strappy leaves. That, those are the seed leaves. So that was what was in the seed. That isn't a true leaf. And then we see this little leaf that looks like a tiny tomato leaf. That is the first set of true leaves. So you can transplant them after you see that. You could wait a little bit longer, but you'll, you don't have a lot of food stores left in that seed 
to grow it. So you would have to have some sort of fertility in this mix in order for it to grow much farther beyond this point. And how do you transplant it? Well, you, you might notice that this is a very little tiny stem. It's not very thick. If you crush that or damage that, you've killed the whole seedling. So what you wanna do is loosen up the soil around this, and then you want to sort of take your fingers, like you're gonna pinch it, and you wanna put it under those little seed leaves and pull it up gently if you have to pull up, or you can get your best seed starting tool available on the market when you order your Chinese food. Here's a chopstick. So just use this to loosen it up a little bit. And you can use that as almost like a little tiny shovel and just pull it up by the leaves and move it over. So there, your best seed starting tool right there. We're gonna use it again in a second. And then you're going to uh, harden it off. So it's a transition period. So after you've grown it in that potting soil indoors for six to eight to 10 to 12 weeks, however long it is, uh, and you're ready to move outside, you can't just go from inside to the garden. You're gonna kill it because you're going from low light, high humidity to high light, low humidity, even indoors. You know, like we think about that with a greenhouse, like that it's very a uh, cushy environment, but even inside, it's a great environment for our plants. So we wanna slowly move them. So you can slowly reduce watering to let them dry out a little bit two weeks before you plant them. And you can also move them in or out, like move them inside and outside, outside during the day, inside during the night, if it's still too cold. Or if it's not too cold, one thing I do is I will put the plants up against like the foundation of the house because it sort of captures heat from the sun during the day and radiates it out during night. So it's like a little protected microclimate. But you wanna have that few week period where they're outdoors in a protected area, at least during the day, but not outdoors in the garden where it's full sun, not enough water. You want to sort of slowly walk them into that uh, location. And so I'm gonna, to, um, to move over uh, and do a, a quick demonstration as we wrap up. I see a question about um, um, worm castings. You can add a little bit of that as fertility. Uh, typically, it's not considered to have pathogens in it. Uh, and then a question about fans. And yes, air movement is good for your seedlings because if they're not moving, so in nature, plants are always moving. And that creates little cracks in their stems and their leaves that then heal up and it actually strengthens, strengthens them. So if you are growing seedlings, if you put a fan on them, then that will give them a little bit of movement and create those little cracks that help them strengthen. Um, and so what we're gonna do now, so here's some ways to, to find us, uh, to find me, and we can throw that up uh, a little bit later again too, but I'm gonna switch screens. I'm going to change my share here. Uh, here we go. Okay. So now we're hopefully looking at me. So I have my little containers there. I have my extensive seed starting tools here. I'm going to use that in a second. And then here is our seed starting mix. So I have this Nice, loose, fluffy mix. You can see that very light and fluffy. This is that commercial mix that I prepared. There's one step to get this ready uh, because we're using, it has peat moss in it. Peat moss holds water well, but it's very hard to get wet. Uh, so if you just put this dry into your containers, you'll notice that when you water it, the water just sort of like sits on it or goes right through and doesn't uh, wet it very well. So what we wanna do is get this a uh, wet, um, and so we're going to add a little bit of water here. We'll let that set a second uh, to moisten up. Uh, and so we can, you know, get that, get that nice and, you know, we can see that it's sort of sticking together. You know, we don't want to waterlog it too much, but we do want to have it uh, nice and, and moist there. So we can see nice and crumbly. Uh, but still, you know, it's holding together. So it's sort of like a, a little sponge and it's wet enough whenever it, you push it together like this and it holds together. But if you, you know, 
If you do that and water falls out of it, that's too much water. Uh, and so you want to, to have that right balance. I did it just perfectly right there. So I'm going to uh, use one of my bulk containers here. You know, my um, uh, just flat, there's no holes in there. I'm going to um, fill in some of my seed starting mix here. So I want to demonstrate two methods for starting seeds. So one way, so you do this, so our, there's our, you know, nice leveled out seed starting mix. I'm trying to figure out which direction the, so you can see it best, figure out the direction of the camera. Uh, so there's our seed starting mix. I have my peppers here uh, that I ordered. So we do all America selections testing here, uh, which is like the good housekeeping seal of approval for garden plants. Uh, and this is one of my favorite things that we've done in the trials before. Uh, this is uh, a lunchbox pepper. So it's like one of those little, little mini peppers that you buy at the grocery store, like you buy them in a, like, a little bag. This one's called Just Sweet. It's the best pepper I've ever eaten. And it's the best plant I've ever grown pepper wise. It's a beautiful, tall, bushy plant. And I wanted to grow some um, for, for this year. So we're getting a very early start on these pepper plants. Hopefully I can um, put them in containers later and keep them, keep them happy and alive. So I'm dropping my seeds here. I wanna space them out a little bit, but they don't have to be too far apart. I just drop them on the soil. And then I know from looking at uh, the seed uh, at, at the packet, uh, they wanna be covered with about a quarter of an inch of potting soil. And so what I'm doing, I have my now uh, expensive uh, garden tool, my chopstick right here. And now it becomes a garden tool called a dibbler. A dibbler means that you just make a hole in something, but I'm gonna dibble this seed in. So I'm just gonna push it down about a quarter of an inch covered over, push down and cover over. That was very simple. Uh, so that's one way that you can plant your, your seeds. Uh, you can also, if it's a bigger seed, you can use the dibbler to make a hole and then drop the seed in so you're not compacting the soil too much. However, if you want an easier way to do it, this is sort of like the, the efficient gardener way, especially if you're doing lots of seeds, because that takes a long time to do each seed individually. I'm gonna sprinkle them on top of the soil. So I'm gonna spread them out a little bit. Um, I had that, that group bunch up there too much. So I could, you know, dibble each of these in, or if I had a bunch of these, let's say I had a, a whole, you know, tray full of them, what I'm gonna do, is go back to my seed starting mix and just sprinkle right on top. And so now I've covered those by about a quarter of an inch. I just firm that down and it's ready to go. They're all covered, they're all ready to go. So what I will do then is after I clean my black plastic tray, uh, this, this big tray that I have, you can see that it's dirty there, I'll clean it. And then I'll put this in there and I'll put all my different things in there and I'll label them so I know that this is my pepper and my next one over will be my tomatoes and my next one over will be this or that. Uh, and then I'll put my humidity dome on top. I'll cover it up. Uh, you can also use a humidifier nearby to help with that as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, grow it out for a few weeks until we get to those first true leaves. And then we'll mix it in. We'll move it into probably, um, you know, either of these individual cups like this with some potting mix in them, or maybe a larger pot, like a three or four inch pot. And we're seeing that more commonly in nurseries and garden centers. Like used to, you would go to the local greenhouse and you would buy like a six pack of tomatoes. Uh, and now you go buy like one tomato in a three inch pot versus the six pack. And that's because I think number one, for retailers, they make more money on individual plants than a six pack. But also, you know, it's hard if you're growing those out to a decent size to get enough, you know, fertility and nutrition in these little six packs. The bigger container, the bigger the container you put your plant in, the more potting soil you have, the more nutrition is in there for the plant. So with stuff like this, you're probably going to have to apply fertilizer, like a water soluble, like miracle Grow type fertilizer. Um, in the later weeks because there's not going to be enough in the potting soil with that volume of soil.